We are continuing our series on spiritual alignment with kingdom principles, resetting our lives around the Word of God. And we've talked about our thinking, we've talked about changing our perspective, we've talked about finding our fulfillment in Jesus alone. And then today we're going to look at something a little bit different. Now, next Sunday, we're going to continue the series, even though it's Family Sunday. And I just want to encourage you, uh, if you've got a child you'd like to be dedicated, if you want to follow the Lord in water baptism, maybe it's been a while you did that as a child, but you want to do it as an adult, uh, that's all next weekend. And we're going to have some fun uh, with the students and the children next week. Uh, The kids are going to meet you at the doors, uh, greeting you next week. Our teenagers are going to be involved in our prayer teams. A lot of stuff going on. There may even be some pudding on stage. I'll just drop that right there and you can come next week, see what that's all about. And then the Sunday after, we'll have one more message on this series and God's really been uh, speaking to me on one more topic. And on that Sunday, which is the first Sunday of February, we're gonna talk about expecting a life of miracles. God's been talking to me pretty heavy about that the last few days, so uh, come and enjoy that, what the Spirit has to say to us. But today, we're going to look at something just a little bit different, and we're going to start with a basic biblical principle that needs to frame everything that we understand and believe and practice regarding our Christian faith. And I've got a lot of scripture today, so I'm going to try to go fast. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it'll be on the screen. You can grab the notes on the Bible app or on our website or always a paper copy out of the Welcome Center if you prefer to do it that way. 2 Corinthians 1, 19 through 22. Hey, by the way, people ask me all the time, Pastor, why do you talk about notes? Because you need to review them during the week. Not because I said them. But because if you don't make it a habit to go over what the Spirit has spoken to you, there's actually a parable about that. Remember the one about the seed cast and then the birds come? And if you don't go over it during the week, then you get to next Sunday and you're like, yeah, what did we talk about last Sunday? As opposed to the Holy Spirit having the opportunity to work on you throughout the week. So that's why we do notes. That's why we encourage you to do the same. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 through 22, here's this principle we're going to start with today. It says, for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver. Between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I, this is Paul talking, preached to you. And as God's ultimate yes, can you say these next six words with me? He always does what he says. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God always does what he says? Sometimes it might be easier to believe that for someone else than it is to believe it for ourselves. But here it is in the word. He always does what he says. Verse 20. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us. And he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. How many of you have a loan and you make payments on it? Don't raise your hands, but most of us have that if you have a house or a car or something of that nature. And you're making payments. The Bible tells us here that the Holy Spirit inside us is that first payment. It's that first installment that promises us that there is more yet to come. There are a lot of absolutes in this passage of Scripture, such as God doesn't change his mind, right? He doesn't waver between yes and no. It says God always does what he says. We read that part. The Scripture in this passage tells us that the Holy Spirit guarantees everything that God has promised us. And maybe the best part, it says that we are enabled through Christ to stand firm in this world. Right, so here's the kingdom principle for us to get started with today. As believers in Jesus, the foundation of our faith is not only our complete confidence in God's ability, but also in the absolute faithfulness of his promises. Can you say amen to that? Right, it's not that God can, it's that God will and God does. That's his promise. So the question for us today is, if we know this to be true, you just say, man, why is it still hard at times? Why is it so difficult to keep our lives aligned with kingdom 
principles? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to talk about it today. How many of you have seen a similar version of this cartoon that we're going to show on the screen? How many of you have seen that one before? Or something similar? Right, now you may have heard it as hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, or something like that. But this shows us, I almost saved this for kids, uh, for family Sunday next Sunday, but this shows us three of our senses, right? And the Holy Spirit has been reminding me that one of the biggest problems with aligning our lives around the Word of God has to do with our senses. What we see, what we hear, and what we speak greatly frame our perception of our spiritual reality. Notice I didn't say it frames our spiritual reality. I said it frames our perception of our spiritual reality. Not to diminish the other two senses of taste and smell, because I'm going to be using those at lunch today. How about you? Right? Those two matter. And the Bible talks about those two. But today, and you can take that down, Scott. Thank you. Today, we're talking about that Scripture gives great attention to seeing, to hearing, and to speaking. And if we're going to align our lives around the truth of God's Word, then we have to understand the impact of what we see Right? We've got some football fans in the room. It's amazing how we always see it differently than the referees <laughs> when it's our team. The other team, they get it right all the time. What we see, the impact of what we hear, and the impact of what we speak. Now, for many of us that grew up in church, uh, depending on what type of church you grew up in, this can quickly descend into legalism. Right? This can quickly become, don't watch this, don't look at that, don't say that, don't listen to this. Like, who got in trouble for listening to Christian rock when you were a kid? Yeah, I did. Had to sneak it into my house, but, well, dad's not here anymore. Sorry, dad. I don't have to hide that anymore. Uh, no, he knew it. We talked about it later. But it can quickly descend into this, into this legalism, right? This list of things you can't watch or look at, like movies or TV or, or books or magazines, right? Things you can't listen to, like Christian rock or secular music. That just means non-Christian music. Or maybe negative people, right? You hear messages. Just cut those people out of your life, because that's sure what Jesus would have done. Um, that was free. You can take that one. Right? Or things we can't say, like no negative confessions, don't admit your circumstances, or other things regarding our conversations and our feelings. Can I just tell you this? It's okay to tell the doctor when you're sick. It's okay to tell the doctor when you're sick and you need help. And sometimes the Holy Spirit has to help us admit our reality so that we can appreciate the supernatural intervention that he's about to bring on our behalf. Now, to be clear, there's a lot of truth in what I just said, right? We should be careful regarding the things that we watch. Can you say amen to that? Right? It's not legalism. It's called holiness. Maybe we need to do a whole series on that at some point after we've taken the offering. Um, <laughs> we should be careful what we watch and what we listen to. And I'm going to read this. I'm not going to look at you. Some of you do need to turn off some of the music or the talk radio you're listening to. Because it's changing the atmosphere in your life. Sometimes we need to turn off or, or put away any type of influence that consistently floods our minds with things that contradict kingdom principles. Right? But that's not the message today. The message today, somebody just said, thank God, is talking about our perspective on life and how we respond when situations arise that aren't quite what we expected. And we're going to take a quick look at three different Bible stories, I told you we had to go fast, that deal with how we see, how we hear, and how we speak. So here's kingdom principle number one. And you turn to the book of 2 Kings. It's time to allow the Holy Spirit to change. Notice I said the Holy Spirit has to do it, because how many of you have figured out at this point in your life, you're pretty much incapable of change on your own? Right? There's freedom in admitting that. So the principle is, it's time to allow the Holy Spirit to change how we see. Now, we have to cooperate in that process. But let's look at 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to read about 9 verses, maybe 10. Verse 8. It says, when the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel... Don't, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. Verse 10, so the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. 
And time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on the alert there. The king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? It's not us, my lord, the king. One of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. How I many you know there's no secrets with God? Nowhere. So go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. Imagine, this is after one guy. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, so this is Elisha's servant, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. I love verse 16. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. What a ridiculous thing to say in the natural. It made no sense to that young man. But then notice verse 17. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Right? The army might have had chariots, but God trumped that with chariots of fire. He wins. Now listen, Elisha's prayer didn't change anything about the situation. Right? The armies of God were already there. They were already dispatched. They had already been placed in the point of Elisha's need. What changed when Elisha prayed was the young servant's confidence, not just in God's ability, but in his provision and his protection because his eyes were open to see clearly what was already happening in the spiritual realm. And many of us as believers are relying far too much on what we see in the natural instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and show us what's really going on in the spiritual and we're making decisions dictated in the natural when God is just waiting for us to pray so he can open our eyes to see what is actually going on. The problem isn't God's ability. The problem isn't God's availability, right? The problem is our point of focus. It's what we're seeing. Now, I got some new glasses this week, which are wonderful, by the way. I'm going to talk about Doc in just a minute. And I just found out these are awesome and they're terrible. Here's why. I was standing back here for the first time today, and I put them on, and I could see up close, because that's all they are, they're just readers, perfectly. There's like three of you all right now. So we have to go back to, back to the store and get some bifocals so the top are straight, so there's not you know, many of you when I look out there. I couldn't read the words on the screen or anything this morning. The problem isn't God's ability. The problem is our point of focus. It's what we're looking at. What is getting our attention? Right? Where are we looking? Are we basing our lives on what we see physically, or are we asking the Holy Spirit to help us see with supernatural vision? So I went to get my eye exam done, and if you need an do eye doctor, go to, go to Lighthouse. Doc Steve is awesome. But he does this thing, you've been there, or is an optometrist, and they're like, look at my finger. Now, it's a pretty good looking finger. It was manicured. He'd done his nails that day. And so he says, focus on the finger, right? And so I'm doing this, and first thing he's doing is, you know, moving the machine and the light and all that around, and, and then he says, okay, follow the finger. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? And so you're, but without moving your head, right? So you're doing this and this, and that whole thing. Now, the point of what he's doing is not to test my ability to focus just on his finger. The finger is not the point. The finger is not the point. The point of looking at his finger is to get me to focus straight ahead and then obviously to follow the finger on a, on a central point. Why? So he can do an exam and see what's going on with my eyes. And he can help me understand where my vision is off. Listen, church, when you choose to focus on Jesus, when you choose to focus on what the Holy Spirit is doing on your life, it opens the door for him to begin to show you things that are wrong and out of alignment, out of adjustment in your life, and then he brings the prescription, he brings the correction. And can I just tell you, when you focus on Jesus, aren't things a whole lot easier? When you keep your eyes on Jesus in your life, doesn't it just make life a whole lot simpler? 
The Holy Spirit has given us one assignment. Focus on Jesus. No matter what comes, no matter what happens, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. We just keep our eyes on Jesus. It's how we maintain our alignment. In Hebrews 12, it talks about this, verse 1 and 2. It says, since we are surrounded by so many examples of faith, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially sin that distracts us. We must run the race that lies ahead of us and never give up. Verse 2 gives us a secret how to do this. We must focus on Jesus, the source and goal of our faith. Oh, church, the Holy Spirit wants to change how we see. What did you spend your time focusing on this week? Was it the problem or was it the problem solver? Was it the situation or was it the way maker? We've got to start looking at Jesus. We've got to start allowing the Holy Spirit to help us change how we see. The second one is it's time to allow the Holy Spirit to help us change how we hear. How we hear. Now, we've all been accused of having selective hearing at times. In fact, I've got a picture here we're going to show. Uh, I've been accused of having this hearing aid. Can you see that? I don't know if there's truth to that, but all the women said amen. (laughs) How many of you know you can choose what you listen to? You can choose what you listen to. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 5, a story about the importance of hearing, verses 17 through 25. It says, when the Philistines heard that David, this is King David, not, it wasn't reigning yet, but he'd been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces to capture him. But David was told they were coming, so he went into the stronghold. The Philistines arrived and spread out across the valley of Rephaim. So David asked the Lord, should I go out to find the Philistines? And there's a great uh, question. Ask the Lord what you should do. There's a good example there. He says, will you hand them over to me? The Lord replied to David, yes, go ahead. I will certainly hand them over to you. Verse 20, so David went to Baal Perazim. By the way, do you know what Baal means? We think of Baal as this really evil thing in the Bible, but yet here it's kind of a holy thing. The word Baal translated means Lord or owner. Whenever you see that word, it's always the object of somebody's worship. It's the object of somebody's what? Focus. So David went to Baal Perazim and and defeated the Philistines there. The Lord did it, David exclaimed. He burst through my uh, enemies like a raging flood. So he named that place Baal Perazim, which means the Lord, there it is, the Lord, Baal, who burst through. The Philistines had abandoned their idols there, so David and his men confiscated them. But after a while, the Philistines returned, and again. How many know the enemy never gives up? Until Jesus comes back. It's over, but it's not over. You know what I mean? So they abandoned their idols there. They confiscated them. But after a while, the Philistines returned and again again spread out across the valley of Rephaim. And again, David asked the Lord what to do. Now, this time, the Lord has a different answer. He says, do not attack them straight on, the Lord replied. Instead, circle around behind and attack them near the poplar trees. I love verse 24. When you hear a sound like marching feet in the tops of the poplar trees. How do you march on the tops of trees? See, this is supernatural. If David was looking for a natural answer here, it wasn't going to happen. If David was going to look for something that fit inside his box, it wasn't going to happen. But God says, hey, when you hear the armies of heaven walking on the leaves, (laughs) in the trees, in the air, he says, that will be the signal that the Lord is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. So David did what the Lord commanded, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. Now, there are several lessons in this passage. We have time for them all today, including one about not always expecting God to move the same way he moved in the past as he wants to move today. Right? We see it right here. Because sometimes God wants to do a new thing. But today we're talking about what we hear. So notice that the Bible doesn't say in this passage that the enemy ever heard the sound. Right? This wasn't a sound to frighten the enemy, although that does happen at times in Scripture. This was a sound exclusively for the purpose of encouraging the servant of God and confirming God's word to him. See, this is why so many times in Scripture it says something like this. Anyone who has ears to hear. What? What? Let him hear. Look at Mark chapter 4. 
It says anyone, verse 23 and 24, it says anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given. If you don't understand what God is doing, maybe we're not listening close enough. Maybe we're not spending enough time in the prayer closet because it's not like God wants to make everything some huge secret. The word actually tells us that he will share his secrets with us. So if we don't know, it's probably because we're not listening close enough. Pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive any more. Let me just say it this way or even more. It's time to stop listening to the lies of the enemy in your life. It is. Now, sometimes you hear it in your head. Sometimes it comes to you in the form of very well-meaning people. It's time to stop listening to the lies of the enemy. It's time to stop listening to people who don't understand the truth of God's word. I always love it when we talk about healing and people uh, tell me that we shouldn't pray for healing because we don't know God's will. Do you read the Bible? The Bible's pretty clear. Now, are there times... That in his sovereignty, he does things we don't understand? Of course. He's God. He gets to make those decisions. But the Bible tells us, past tense, that we are healed. So why wouldn't we pray for healing? Why wouldn't we pray for the things that the Bible says? We're going to talk about that in two weeks, about a life of miracles, expecting miracles. It's time to start listening to what the Spirit is speaking over our lives. So we've got to spend time in our prayer closets. We've got to learn to recognize his voice. We got to spend time. It's amazing to me. I've been a school principal many, many years, been around kids, playgrounds, all of that. It's amazing to me how a mom can recognize the cry of their child amongst a hundred other kids on the playground. How many of you moms know that's true? You recognize your kid, don't you? Why is that so? I mean, seriously, it's not a trick question. Why is that so? Because you spend a lot of time with your kid and you learn to recognize their voice because you're around it all the time. It's the same principle here. The more time we spend with God, the more time we spend in his presence in our prayer closet, the more we learn to recognize his voice, and then we choose to listen to what the Spirit is speaking. And it's time to let the Holy Spirit help us change what we hear. We have a lot of time today. Here's number three. It's time to allow the Holy Spirit to change how we speak. I want to spend a little time here today. In Mark chapter 4, a lot of passages out of Mark today just worked out that way. But Mark chapter 4, let's read verses 35 through 41. This is during the life of Jesus' ministry. And it says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Now, if they'd have been listening, the story could have just ended right there. Because Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake. But they weren't listening. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed, literally chasing them across the lake. But soon a fierce storm came up, and high waves were breaking into the boat. By the way, there's not a whole lot of fear similar to being out in the middle of the ocean with those kind of waves. I've been there. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. And Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. I don't think it's because he had his hearing aid turned off. I think it's because he was at rest in the presence of his father. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care? They interpreted his sleeping as all of a sudden this Jesus, who was literally already telling them, I'm going to give my lives for you as someone who now just doesn't care that they're going to drown. Man, their faith was short-lived, just like ours is at times. Don't you care? We're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence! Be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. Now the point that is so easy, easy, excuse me, the point that is so easy to miss in this story And it requires a little bit of Christological theology, just theology about Jesus. Is that Jesus didn't, and follow me for a minute, Jesus didn't just speak to the wind and the waves as God. Because if Jesus had just spoken to the waves as God, 
and the wind, then it's a nice story of God demonstrating his power on earth that really does nothing for us except, of course, to encourage our trust in God, which is a good thing. But there's far more, I believe, going on here. The deeper lesson, and I'm going to show it to you in a moment, is that I believe any one of these disciples could also have spoken to the wind and the waves. They also could have operated in their supernatural spiritual authority as their position as children of God. Now, how do I know that? Well, look at what Jesus teaches them just a few chapters later in Mark chapter 11. Verse 22, it says, And Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith. Remember, he says, How do you have so little faith? So he's teaching on faith. He says, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. If that's true, then we have to believe that any one of those disciples could have left Jesus sleeping, which may have just been what he was waiting for anyway. For someone to stand up in their spiritual authority, to take authority, dominion over something, leave Jesus over there and speak in the authority of who they were as children of God. But instead, they went right to fear, right to panic, to the point that they even questioned their faith, don't you even care that we're going to die? Now, that's pretty accusational, but how many of us at times have lived our lives that way? Instead of standing up, taking authority that's been given to us as children of God and speaking over something, instead, we let fear come in, we let panic come in to the point that it actually shakes our faith that God would even allow this to happen. I wonder if that went through their minds. What Jesus is there, why is all this happening? Instead, they needed to stand up in authority and speak to the wind and the waves. There's a reason Proverbs 8.21 tells us that the power of life and death is in the... You think Scripture is here by accident? Or does it have a purpose? Is it alive and powerful today? Now listen, I know I'm walking a line here. We're not talking about denying our circumstances, right? Jesus asked the blind man, what's wrong with you? What do you want me to do? And the blind man says to Jesus, I'm blind, I'd like to see. So there's something about admitting the circumstance. He had to admit he was blind before the miracle could occur. But there's a huge lesson to be learned here about speaking in faith what the Holy Spirit has already spoken over your life on behalf of the Father. What are you saying? What are you speaking over your life? What are you speaking over your children? What are we speaking over our marriages? What are we speaking over our finances? What are we speaking? Now, you can speak over it, but unless you're listening to what the Holy Spirit says about it, it's kind of a vain point because if you're speaking over your finances but still making a bunch of purchases you shouldn't make, right? The Holy Spirit is speaking while we speak, right? He's talking to us so we can say what we hear the Spirit saying. That's the way this works. Huge lesson to be learned here about speaking in faith, what the Holy Spirit has already spoken on behalf of of the Father over our lives. A lot of things we could say today, but I want to leave you with one more story. I'm going to read this, and then the team's going to come. In Mark chapter 8, verses 13 through 18, talking about Jesus, it says, So he got back into the boat, and he crossed to the other side of the lake. But the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. They had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. And as they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, He's just trying to teach him. He says, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And at this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Once again, they weren't listening closely enough. They were putting their own human spin on what they thought it was that Jesus said. Oh, so many times I've done that. Right. Just give God a, a, a passing prayer. I remember being a kid, and you'd be get home like late, late, late from church. And the last thing you wanted to do is get ready for bed and brush your teeth and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know where this came from. I know my grandma used to say it, so my mom would say it. And she'd send us to the bathroom, and she, about brushing our teeth, she would say, just give them a lick and a promise. Anybody ever heard that before? I don't know where it came from. My family's all from Oklahoma and Arkansas, so who knows? Somewhere there, which I've been told is not the South. I get it. Okay, whatever. <laughs> 
Um, but I think sometimes, you know, so we'd go in there, and I mean, half the time, I'm not even sure we put toothbrush, I mean, toothpaste on the toothbrush. Like, okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm off to bed. But I think sometimes we treat our prayer life like that. We give our prayer life with God a lick and a promise. And say, well, God, you, you see my effort, I tried. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Now, probably got some dentists in the house. They're like, fine, you can keep me busy. <laughs> Talk to Sandy Hayes. She'll tell you about it. But look at what Jesus says. He says, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. And at this, they begin to argue with each other because they haven't brought any bread. Here we go. Jesus knew what they were saying. So he said, why are you arguing about having no bread? He's like, that isn't even what I was talking about. Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? Now check this out. He says, you have eyes, you can't see. You have ears, you can't hear. Don't you remember anything at all? And here Jesus ties together all three of these senses to make a point. Team, why not you guys come on? So in this passage, he references what we say, he references what we see, and he references what we hear. And then he concludes with a very interesting reference to our minds, our remembrance, which is informed and controlled to a large degree by our senses. And he's saying, listen, how we choose to look at a situation matters. How we see things matter. He's saying how we choose to listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking over our lives matters. That's how we hear he says, how we choose to speak what the Holy Spirit has already spoken, that matters. How we speak. So when we choose to align ourselves with kingdom principles, right, in, in his kingdom, here's the difference. Where we once saw seeming defeat, we now see guaranteed victory. Where we once saw impossible circumstances, we now see the provision of God. Who's had God come through for you in an impossible situation? Right, you, you see it on the other side. Where we once heard the lies of the enemy, we now hear God's promises of deliverance. And where we once spoke death, we now speak life because Jesus has given us life. Church, how we see, I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you today, how we see, how we hear, how we speak, it changes because we remember what God has already done. And we anticipate in complete confidence what he has yet to do. So here's the question for the day. Are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to realign our senses? Are we willing to fully believe and then live and speak like the promises of God over our lives are what the word says at the very beginning is yes and amen. Would you go ahead and stand up? We're going to sing a song today, and I want to invite you to do something a little bit different today. I don't know which of these three, maybe all three, but which of these three presented the area where you struggle the most. Whether it's the words that come out of your mouth, to speak in alignment with what the truth of God's word says over your life. I don't know if it's what you hear, what you listen to, what other people were speaking, you're having a hard time dealing with that. I don't know if it's what you see. All you see is the problem. You can't see the hand of God. But I want to encourage you. We're going to sing a song called All His Promises or what? Come on. Yes and amen. And I want you to specifically think about that area that's given you trouble. And as we sing today, I want you to begin to give that to God and declare that his promises over your life in that area, in that situation, in that habit, whatever it is, are yes and amen over your life. Because if you don't start speaking it, you're never going to believe it. Did you hear me? If you don't start speaking it, your spirit is never going to believe it. Speaking it is how we bring our lives into alignment with what the Spirit of God is saying over our life. So as we sing this song today, all God's promises, I want you to just, just surrender that thing to God. Maybe it's your children. Maybe, I don't know what it is. I'm not even going to try to name what it is for you. But I'm just going to tell you, God wants to bring your senses into alignment with what the Spirit is speaking and saying over your life today. Let's sing this song together. Amen. And celebrate that God is moving in your behalf today. Right. 
the task before you this week is what are you going to choose to focus on? And I hope you remember my finger, well, Doc Richardson's finger. And I hope you remember the principle of focusing on Jesus, focusing what the Holy Spirit is speaking over your life. And some of you need to go underline the passage of scripture that this song comes from. It's where we started the message today. I wanna read it to you one more time. Second Corinthians one. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. It says, yes, he always does what he says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, our agreement, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. And it is God who enables us to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us, identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It's the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. If God has spoken to you, he has guaranteed it by giving you the Holy Spirit. That's what the word tells us. So this week, where are you going to choose to focus? Well, as believers in Jesus, we focus on the promises of God. See, pastor, that's hard, I know, I know. The Holy Spirit's gonna help you do it. The Holy Spirit's gonna help you do it. I wanna speak this over your life today. And I want you to leave singing this song in your spirit. And I want you to leave with a, a, a single focus on God's presence and ability, availability in your life. If you're ready to receive this, just raise your right hand to heaven. It says, be blessed as you allow the Holy Spirit to realign how you hear the assurance of his voice. Be blessed as you allow the Holy Spirit to realign how you see the goodness of his hand. Be blessed as you allow the Holy Spirit to realign how you speak the faithfulness of his promises. And be blessed as you allow the Holy Spirit to help you remember that all of his promises are yes and amen. Be blessed today in Jesus' name. We love you. We'll see you next week. Hey, thanks again for joining us today. Just one more reminder, we are always here to serve you. Uh, You can contact us at the church office. You can send an email to prayer at hopechurchallgood.com. Daniel and Dusty are here to serve you. We want to be your church community online. So however we can serve you, uh, please just let us know. And as you go today, whether you're watching this live, you're watching this later, just take what we said in the message today that God does really have a plan and a purpose for your life. The promises of God really are yes and amen. And it's time to start believing not what culture says about our life, not what people might say about our life, but what God has spoken over our life. Take that with you and have a blessed week.